thank you. That clock's a little different. So uh, thank you all for coming. And Dr. Tony Weathers is going to show us how to have fun with numbers today. There is also another lunch talk on Monday, this coming Monday the 17th, that I have emailed at least the, those of you in Porter Hall about, but for those of you who may not get those emails, uh, will be a Porter Scholar student named Ryan Miller. He'll be talking about some of the research that he did uh, on some acid mine drainage. So that is also, it is on the, the main schedule, but uh, you may not have seen a notification about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome and, uh, and, and thanks for coming. Uh, today, as you can see, is April 13th. And uh, there's a reason uh, that this talk is on April 13th. I chose this date specifically because it was the 13th. For those of you who do not know, this is in fact the 13th year of the Lunchtime Talks uh, in Science and Mathematics series, which was begun by uh, Matt Neering uh, when he, back when he was department chair. It has since obviously been handed off to the uh, capable and willing hands of Tim Armstrong. Okay. Uh, some of you also know, because I tend to go on about this, that uh, I've had the unique privilege of uh, participating in this series every single year, which means that this is my 13th consecutive year of uh, giving a talk in this forum. And it is, in fact, the number 13 that was the impetus for today's topic, because I got to thinking about the number 13, and, uh, and April 13th was the only 13th on the calendar that actually worked. It has nothing to do with the fact that today is Thomas Jefferson's birthday, which it is. Um, it also has nothing to do with the fact that uh, on today in 1970, the Apollo 13 spacecraft uh, encountered its uh, oxygen tank explosion, which prompted Jim Lovell to radio back to Earth the famous yet frequently misquoted uh, s statement, Houston, we've had a problem, okay? Um, but I hope we won't encounter any such problems uh, today. And so the number 13 I find interesting for, for a lot of reasons. The main thing is that a lot of people are afraid of the number 13, okay? And, and you might wonder who, who would be afraid of such a number. Well, people who suffer from a condition known as triskaidekaphobia, okay? Uh, would, would be in that category. Uh, and this word is actually an amalgam of several Greek words, uh, meaning three um, and ten. I don't know what's going on here. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, it worked on Sunday. But I, I hope that the rest of these don't, uh, don't mess up. It is. It's the 13th. See, there we go. I, I had to... I had to jinx it, right? If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, right, they have a glitch with one of the engines, and, and at one point Jim Lovell famously remarks, well, we've had our glitch for this mission. So, uh, he, he, uh, uh-oh. Okay, well, let's see. Let's hope that the, that the rest... So anyway, it, it, it's tri so tris means three, and then the, the chi means, uh, uh, means and, and then of course this means 10, and phobos means fear, and so it means the fear of three and 10, okay? Um, and so you might wonder, well, why did this start? What's wrong with the number 13? Well, what's wrong with the number 13? Uh, so I did some research to try to figure out why is 13 regarded as, uh, as a bad number, okay? And it's, there's dozens and dozens of reasons that you can find out on the internet. Uh, most of the, the, the most prominent ones, at least, are religiously based, strangely enough. Um, so first off, from Norse mythology, uh, we see that uh, Loki was supposed to be the 13th god in the Norse pantheon. Okay, and if you know anything about uh, Loki, which you may know from certain uh, recent popular movies, you know that he was a bit of a troublemaker. Uh, in particular, he murdered Balder, the god of happiness, and was reportedly the 13th guest to arrive at Balder's funeral. Okay, so there, there you go. Uh, there's a good, good reason to be uh, shy of uh, 13 or wary of 13. Um, but then uh, the Christians also get in on the act because they claim that Judas was the 13th guest to sit down at the Last Supper. Okay? And again there, if you know the story, you know that Judas is one of the more reviled characters uh, in, 
in, uh, in Christianity. In, in fact, he literally has a special place in hell. Okay? If, if you read Dante's Inferno, Dante's Inferno portrays Satan as a three-headed beast, and, and each mouth is chewing on somebody famous from history, and of course one of them is Judas. Uh, the other two are, um, are Cassius and Brutus, and so Dante apparently uh, didn't, didn't have uh, much favorable to say about people who betray other folks. Okay? Um, but then also, and I'll say more about this a little bit later, um, Philip IV of France and Pope Clement V uh, conspired to wipe out the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were a Christian military organization that Philip found himself deeply in debt to, and rather than pay off his debt, he just decided to kill them all. Okay? <laughs> and, and you'll notice that this purge began on Friday, October 13th, and of course, I'll have something to say about Friday the 13th a little bit later on. But uh, whatever the reason, it is a fact that lots and lots of people are afraid, straight up afraid of the number 13. So much so, in fact, that if you go to Elevatorpedia, okay, and look, you can find lots and lots of uh, key panels for elevators, and what you'll notice is that they are all missing the number 13. Not a single one of them has the number 13. And so it, it is so pervasive that people go to great lengths to avoid using the number 13. And, and just in case you think that maybe this is some sort of weird far off thing, no, this hits very close to home because I did exhaustive research and I determined that there is not a single building in the San Luis Valley that has a 13th floor. <laughs> not one, okay? <laughs> not a single one. Um, and the 13 thing seems to be universal, but of course there are some other superstitions involving numbers uh, around the world. Uh, in particular, in China, uh, the word for the number four sounds very similar to the word for death. And so four is regarded as an especially unlucky number uh, in China and indeed in, in many Asian cultures. Okay? And I believe it's Cantonese is, is the specific dialect where, that, where that's true. Okay. Uh, in Japan, nine is feared because it sounds similar to the word for torture or suffering. Okay. And, then, uh, and then over in, in Italy, uh, some Italians are superstitious about 17, and this is a bit of a stretch, but if you take the Roman numeral XVII, you can rearrange it into this word, which in Latin means, my life is over. Okay. All right. Now, I showed you the, the, uh, the panels, the elevator panels, uh, presumably from somewhere in the United States, but it's, it's rather interesting. Here are three elevator panels, uh, one from Beijing, or, or excuse me, Shanghai, one from Hong Kong, and this one, I don't know where the actual elevator is located, but it was manufactured by a company called Fujitech. You'll notice, not only are they missing the 13, and by the way, not only are they missing the four, they don't have any fours whatsoever, okay? There's no 14, there's no 24 on, on any of these. And so, apparently, the four is a, uh, quite a powerful superstition in, in, in Asia. Uh, and uh, I don't know what else to make of that. Although, Elevatorpedia, that's uh, something I came across. I didn't even know such a thing existed. So, there you go, Elevatorpedia. All right. Now, earlier I mentioned uh, about the Knights Templar and the purge beginning on Friday the 13th. And so, let's talk about Friday the 13th for a little bit. So who is afraid of a, of a day? Well, people who suffer from a condition named Paraskevi decatriophobia. Okay, and we'll see if this works. Okay, <laughs> uh, this is an amalgam of some, some more Greek words, the one meaning Friday, the one meaning 13, and the one meaning fear. Although you'll notice that in contrast to triskaidekaphobia, they use a slightly different construction to get at 13 here. Okay, they use decatria instead of... Uh, instead of the three and 10, so decatria. Um, it's also known as Frigatriscadecophobia, and that's from the, the Norse goddess uh, Frigg, or Freya, who uh, the day Friday is named after, okay? And so, um, now, we're gonna talk a little bit about Friday the 13th, and so before I get to that, I wanna ask a, a question here. Who, by show of hands, know that every fourth year is a leap year? How many of you know that? Okay, well, guess what? You're all wrong. <laughs> that was true under the old Julian calendar, okay? Under the old Julian calendar that, ju that named after Julius Caesar. But of course, the Gregorian calendar is what we use now. And the Gregorian calendar was introduced in October of 1582 by Pope Gregory the 13th. 
there's 13 again, okay? And what it did was it, it actually changed the number of leap years, okay? So on the, on the old scheme, every, every fourth year was a leap year, which meant that every 400 years, there would be 100 leap years, right? Well, one of the reforms of the Gregorian calendar was it made the so-called century years operate under a different rule. And so the century years, the ones that end in, in zero, zero, are only leap years if the first two digits are divisible by four, okay? So for instance, 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years, but 2000, as you may recall, was, All right? So what this meant, what this means is that now in every 400 years, you only have 97 leap years. And what that did was it effectively changed the, the mean length of a year from 365 and a quarter to 365.2425 which is a, a reduction, a slight reduction, 10 minutes and 48 seconds uh, reduction. Say it again. <laughs> okay, well, um, so, so what, this, what this meant, was, so the old Julian calendar drifted, I think it was something like a day every 128 years, but the, the new one drifts only, or, or maybe it was an hour. Every, anyway, the new one uh, drifts much less than the old one did, okay? But what this means is that we can actually look at the distribution of the 13th. Because of the way the Gregorian calendar is structured, it operates on a 400-year cycle. So every 400 years, the cycle repeats itself completely. Okay? And so there are 400 years, and there's 12 months in a year, so that means there's 4,800 months in a 400-year cycle. And so it's a fairly straightforward, although tedious, exercise to go through each of those 4,800 months and look at what day of the week does the 13th occur, occur on. And if you do that, what you come up with is this distribution, and you see that the statistical leader is Friday. So Friday is actually the day of the week that it is most likely to, for the 13th to occur on. And then today, Thursday, is actually tied for last with Saturday. Okay. So Friday the 13th, and it makes you kind of wonder if it's, if it's supposed to be such a bad thing, but it's the most likely day that it would occur. Seems kind of strange. All right, so um, when, I, when I talked about Judas, I, I mentioned Satan, and, and so let's, let's go with that for a minute, because he's a rather interesting character, because as you know, he gets his own number, right? And in fact, if you, if you re, if in, the, uh, in the King James Version of the Bible, here's Revelation chapter 13, again, uh, verse 8, that says, uh, the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 603 score and 6, Okay, and everybody knows this is a rather famous number. And so, uh, of course, people are afraid of it as well. And those people are said to suffer from hexacosio hexaconta hexaphobia, okay. <laughs> which is a great big word. And it's kind of neat. It's also an amalgam of several Greek words, one that means 600, one that means 60, and the other means six, and then fear. Okay, so fear of 666 is, uh, is the condition there. And... Uh, let's see. Okay. So now, as a number, though, this is a really interesting number, okay? Because it's got lots of fun mathematical properties, okay? Uh, one of them is that it actually is the sum of the first 36 positive integers. So if you just add 1 through 36 all together, okay? And by the way, that's called a triangular number, and you'll see more about that later in the show, okay? Um, and, and if... but. It, it adds up to 666. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the sigma notation, if, if instead of writing it as 36, you write it as 6 times 6, then it looks a little more fun. It's the, the sum from 1 to 6 times 6 is 666, okay? But it's also got some other interesting properties. For instance, if you take the first seven prime numbers and square them and add it together, you get 666. Okay. And there's, there's several other ways that you can construct this number. One is that you can take 1 to the 6th minus 2 to the 6th plus 3 to the 6th, and it comes out to be 666 again. Okay. Um, uh, and then uh, another one that's really kind of interesting is if you take 666 and raise it to the 6th power, the expansion actually has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sixes in it. Okay. But wait... <laughs> there is more, more fun with 666. If you take the digits 1 through 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, it turns out there is a way to insert plus signs into that string of digits 
and get a number that adds up to 666. Even better, there are two ways that you can insert plus signs into that string of digits and come up with the total of 666. Even if you turn them around and write them from 9 down to 1, there is yet another way that you can insert plus signs into that string of digits and come up with a sum of 666. And so, so there you go. Fun with uh, 666. Okay. Now, before we leave uh, biblical references, here is the most bizarre and useless fact that I discovered in the course of preparing for this talk. Okay, so if those of you who are familiar with the Bible, you know uh, there's the King James Bible. It was commissioned in 1604 by James, well, he's James the sixth and first, because he was James the sixth of Scotland, but he was James the first of England and Ireland. Okay, and in 1604, he commissioned what he de decided was going to be the definitive translation of, of, the, of, the, of the Bible. Um, it was actually finished in late 1610, was published in 1611. Okay, now, if you know anything much about the Bible, you know there is a book in the Bible called the Psalms. And the, and the book of Psalms is 150 psalms, or songs of praise is, is one way that's often translated. Okay, and, and on a variety of topics. If you look at Psalm 46 and you count the 46th word from the beginning of Psalm 46, that word is shake. If then you turn around and count the 46th word from the end, that word is spear. Shake, spear. Okay? Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how old Shakespeare was when the King James Version was published? He was 46. 46 years old. Okay? <laughs> Isn't that a hoot? No, no, he wasn't 13, although that is a good guess. 13 is a good guess. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's more fun if you use the, the, the original archaic spelling because in the, in the modern versions, of course, the E is dropped off and then it doesn't look quite as impressive. But um, so, so anyway, as I said, a bizarre and useless fact, as are most facts from numerology, okay? Um, at any rate, <clears throat> let's get into some, some other numbers. Okay, let's talk about figurate numbers. Okay, so a figurate number, what is that? Well, it's a number that can be represented by a geometrical arrangement of equally spaced points. Okay, and now I have some fairly fancy animations going on here. I hope they work. As I said, they worked on Sunday. But um, the first one we'll talk about is triangular numbers. You may recall that I said that 666 was a triangular number because it was the sum of the digits from 1 to 36. So if you start off with a triangular array like this, and then you, you just say, for instance, you draw a box around that, so that's just one little dot in the box. Okay, so 1 is the first triangular number. Then you draw a box around the next little triangle, you get those three dots, and so 3 is the next triangular number and on and on. So you go down to the next one, you get six dots in the box, and then you get 10, and then you get 15, and then you get 21 and 28, and of course this continues. But what you notice here is that at each stage, if I go back a couple of stages, when you get to 15, how do you get 15? You get it because you add one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. And so 36, or excuse me, 666 is the sum, if I had drawn this triangle all the way down to the, the row that had 36 of them in it, then it would have 666 dots um, in that uh, triangle. Of course, you can also do this with a square, okay? And so for square numbers, you would start off with a, a square array like that and do something similar. And again, starting in the upper left corner, you start with the one, and then you capture the next little square, and that has four, and then nine, and then 16, and 25, et cetera, okay? In case you've ever wondered why those numbers were referred to as square numbers, or if you ever wondered why the process of multiplying a number times itself was called squaring the number, it's because you can do something like this. Of course, it's also because, for instance, if you take a, a square whose sides are three units each, then the area is nine, and that's three times three, okay? So it's, it's a very geometric thing, uh, and uh, figure it numbers, uh, are, are kind of fun to play with because they, uh, they lend themselves well to pictures. And, and of course, you can continue this on. You can go and get pentagonal numbers, 
Okay, so if you do this with a pentagon, then you generate the pentagonal numbers. Of course, you can also do it with a hexagon and generate the hexagonal numbers. Um, the heptagonal numbers, okay, and you can go, I mean, as far as you like, the octagonal and, and so on. But what's interesting here, notice that one is in every single list. Of course it is, and that's, that's because one, I mean, the, the single dot, the, the fancy mathematical term for it, we would say that, that represents a degenerate triangle. Right, a triangle that has sort of collapsed down. And it also represents a degenerate square and a degenerate one, or a pentagon and, and hexagon and such. But if you look at the pattern here, so forget about the ones and look at what happens next. So in the pentagonal numbers, look at what you add. You add seven to get to the next number, and then you add 10, and then you add 13. So you start by adding seven, and then the difference between the things you're adding each time goes up by three. All right? And then down here, you'll notice that you start by adding nine, and then the next one is 13. So then you start by adding 9, and the amount that you add to the thing you're adding is 4. And so at each stage, that works. And so here you're adding 11, and then you add 11 plus 5, which is 16. Down here you add 13, then you add 13 plus 6, which is 19, 19 to get to the next one. So you can see patterns within the patterns here. Of course you can. It's numbers, right? Lots of fun with numbers. All right? And so um, the figurate numbers were known to the ancient Greeks. They studied them, were very interested in what, what you could do with little pebbles, because they didn't have paper to write on, I guess. And so you could make all sorts of nice little arrangements. Um, another thing that the Greeks were, were all over is prime numbers, okay? So let's talk about prime numbers. What is a prime number? Well, it's a positive integer that possesses exactly two positive divisors. Now, this is slightly different from the, the definition that you might have heard. Most people say it's a number whose only divisors are one and itself. Okay, the problem with that is it seems to leave the door open for one itself to be considered prime, and it's not. In fact, the ancient Greeks didn't even really consider one to be a number. Okay, they considered one to be unity, and that was the thing that generated all other numbers, but they didn't, strictly speaking, consider one to be a, a number in and of itself. And so if you look at the, the list of primes, it goes something like this, at least the first uh, several of them, okay, um, uh, up to 53. Okay. And, um, and it turns out that it is a well-known fact, was known before the time of Euclid, that there are infinitely many of these things, infinitely many prime numbers. And I won't go into the details of the proof, but it's a, it's a clever and, and elegant little proof. And essentially what you do is you assume that there are only finitely many. And if there's only finitely many, then you can list them all out, and then you can turn around and use that list to generate another prime number that's not in the list, okay? Thereby contradicting the fact that it, there's only finitely many, right? And so, um, uh, let's see. So infinitely many primes, again, that's been, been known for 2,500 years or so, okay? Uh, you'll also notice that um, after you get past uh, 2 and 3, it's not possible to have consecutive integers that are prime. Does anybody know why? Any of the non-mathematicians in the audience know why that might be? Well, if you think about it for a moment, if you have consecutive integers, regardless of what those consecutive integers are, one of them has to be even. Okay? And so 2 is the only even prime number, and so once you get past there, it's not possible to have consecutive integers that are prime. Okay? So that's easy to see. Well, how about primes that are separated by 2? Well, you can see some of those in the list, and they happen so often, and they're of such interest. They're called twin primes. Okay? So for instance, five and, 3 and 5, 5 and 7, 11 and 13, 17 and 19. Those are so-called twin primes. Uh, they're two units apart. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you want to get famous, you could prove whether the number of twin primes is infinite or not, because it is still an open question. There is a thing called the twin prime conjecture that posits that there are infinitely many twin primes, but nobody has been able to prove it. Okay? Now, here's the weird thing. They, they keep looking for them, and as far as we keep looking for them, we keep finding them. And as of September 2016, the largest pair of twin primes discovered were these. Okay, and so look, you got 2 trillion 996 billion and change, okay, times 2 raised to the power 1,290,000, and then plus or minus 1, okay. <laughs> I thought it would be interesting to show you what these numbers look like, but it turns out that each of these numbers has 388,342 digits. 
And I thought, gosh, how hard would that be to print out? <laughs> so I did some research. Actually, I played around, I opened up Microsoft Word, okay? And so Microsoft Word with the default margins of an inch and a quarter on the side, an inch at the top and the bottom, using a 10 point font, I was able to get 53 lines on a page and 77 digits on a line, which means that it would take a little over 95 pages to print out each one of those numbers, okay? And I didn't think that that was a good use of university resources. <laughs> Besides, I'm not even sure how I would go about fi finding the, the digits to, to write out. I mean, it's not like you could do this in your calculator, okay? At least not easily. Uh, and I doubt that Mathematica, at least out of the box, has the ability to do 388,000 digit numbers, okay? So twin primes have been a, an object of interest for many years. And so I'll show you something here that, that you'll like. This is a copy of Newsweek magazine from July 29, 2002. And it shows President Bush on a golf outing, and each of them is wearing a baseball cap with the number of his presidency. And what you'll notice is that the elder Bush was president number 41, the younger was 43, and those are twin primes. Twin primes right on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Okay. You might be wondering, well, wait a minute, weren't there other father-son combinations that were president? Yes, there was one. Does anybody know? John Adams and John Quincy Adams, okay? They were the second and sixth presidents of the United States. And then there, there was, well, there was one other combination that was a grandfather-grandson, William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison, okay? Benjamin Harrison was the grandson, okay? And they were the ninth and 23rd presidents, uh, respectively, and, and only one of those is prime, so darn. So a, a unique thing uh, for, for President uh, Bush there, okay? Um, there are more sorts of interesting primes. For instance, if you, if you have primes that are separated by four units, they are called cousin primes, I guess because they're somewhat more distant than Twins, uh, yuck, yuck, yuck. So for instance, three and seven, seven and 11, 13 and, and 17, those would be called cousin primes. Uh, primes that are separated by six units are called sexy primes. <laughs> and I'm not making that up, it, it really is a thing. And of course it has to do with the, the, the six, not because there's anything intrinsically attractive about them, okay? But five and 11 or seven and 13, 11 and 17, okay? Uh, there's even a thing called prime triplets. Prime triplet is a form P, P plus 2, P plus 6, okay? So for instance, 5, 7, and 11 are a prime triplet. So are 11, 13, and 17. And now wait a minute, someone says, didn't you skip one? No, in fact, it's impossible to have a sequence of primes of the form P, P plus 2, and P plus 4 because if you have any set of integers of that form, one of them has to be divisible by three. Okay, one of those has to be divisible by three, a, a fact that I think I'll have my Math 250 class prove one of these days. Okay, it's actually not hard to prove using modular arithmetic, okay? So, um, now, one way that you can generate the primes is with a thing called the sieve of Eratosthenes. If you, Eratosthenes was an, an, an ancient Greek guy. He was, he was the one who actually calculated the, the circumference of the earth by making some observations about the way the sun's shadow uh, went down a well and was only off by about 2%, so a pretty darn good estimate for ancient times. And that also belies the notion that ancient people thought the earth was flat, okay? Only backwards people thought that the earth was flat. I mean, we've known the earth was round for quite some time. But at any rate, so the sieve of Eratosthenes works like this. You start off with a, an array of the numbers, and I only showed you uh, up to 40 for, because we don't have all day, okay? And so the first thing you do is you cross out one, because remember, one's not prime. And then you come to the next number and you say two. Okay, so two is prime. Then what we do is we go through the list and we cross out every multiple of two, okay? In other words, every second number in the list, we would go through and we cross out, okay? And of course, it would keep going if I had more numbers there. The next number you come to is three, so then you go through and you cross out all multiples of three, which is, again is another way of saying every third number in the list. Now keep in mind that many of the multiples of three have already been crossed out, for instance, six, okay? So when I do this, you, you see that we lose nine and 15 and some others, okay? You lose all of those, then you come to five and you do the same thing, 
Right? You cross out every fifth number in the list, again, keeping in mind that many of them are already crossed out, and so you lose those. And then by the time I get to seven, well, at this point, there, all the multiples of seven in the list have already been crossed out, okay? And so the rest of the numbers you see remaining there are prime, and you can continue this as far as you like, okay? Now, this is interesting because in 1956, uh, four authors whose names I, I, I can't remember, didn't really try too hard, to be honest, okay, came up with an idea of uh, using a similar sieving process uh, to generate another sequence of numbers that they, and then in the paper they say, for the sake of brevity, we will call them lucky numbers. They don't really give any other justification, although perhaps they thought that it would, they, these were the numbers that were lucky enough to survive this process, okay? And the first thing you do is you start by crossing out all the even numbers, and I, I just skipped that because it clutters up the picture. Okay, so then you go, you say one, okay, so one's a lucky number, we're gonna keep that, and then you go to three. And now the process works similar to the sieve of Eratosthenes in that what we're gonna do is we're going to cross out every third number in the list. So we cross out the five, and then the 11, and on down the list, okay? And so at this point, it looks just like the way the sieve of Eratosthenes works, okay? But in the next step, you see the difference, because in the next step, now we have seven. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cross out every seventh number, but only every seventh number in the remaining list, not every seventh number overall, okay? So if you start at the beginning, you say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so boom, we cross out 19, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you cross out 39, and so on, and so on. Oh, oops. Uh, the next one is off the list, actually. Then you come to nine, and then you start over. So now you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we lose 27, and so on. And then, of course, looky there. 13 is a lucky number, <laughs> okay? It is a lucky number, all right? And then you cross out the, all the 13, uh, every 13th number in the list, and then you repeat, but then, of course, you finally get to where all the rest of the numbers in this list are, in fact, lucky numbers. Okay, so that is the, the, the process, the sieving, sieving, I think I'm saying that right, uh, process by which you generate the lucky numbers, all of which is meant to show you that 13, despite what we may have said at the beginning of the talk, is in fact a lucky number. Okay, let's talk about friendly pairs. Okay, friendly numbers, right? And so, uh, rather than try to give you a definition, I'll just show you how this works because it's a bit wordy. So consider the numbers 30 and 140. And you take the number uh, 30 and you look at all of its positive divisors. And the positive divisors are 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, and 15. And if you add all of its positive divisors and then divide by the number itself, okay, what you get is 42 over 30, which reduces to 7 fifths. Okay? And if you do the same thing with 140, and you write out all of its positive divisors, add them together, divide by the number itself, you get 196 over 140, which also reduces to 7 fifths, okay? And so um, one, one of my sources referred to this as the divisor density of the number, and so if they have the same divisor density, then they, are, they, they comp uh, compose what's called uh, a friendly pair, okay? And there's lots of friendly pairs. Uh, here's, here's a few more just, just to show you, okay? And oh, by the way, it is an open question as to whether there are infinitely many friendly pairs or not. So again, if you wanna make some, you wanna make your name in, in mathematics, you could just prove that. Um, and, and, one, and another one of the sources I said, said rather laconically, a number with no friends is called solitary. <laughs> just like people, <laughs> I thought. Um, and it turns out that 13 is solitary. 13 has no friends. Oh, okay, that'll teach it, right? Um, now you can ex extend this idea to friendly triples because there are friendly triples that do the same thing, and you notice that those get fairly large in a hurry. Um, you'll also notice, perhaps from the previous slide, that six and 28 were a friendly pair. They're also two-thirds of a friendly triple. Um, they're also half of a friendly quadruple. And I'll have more to say about six and 28 uh, later, and I'll explain to you why that is, okay? Uh, and you can extend this as far as you like, friendly quintuples, and I didn't really have room to fit another one on there, okay? because those, those things get uh, rather large. 
Now, the friendly numbers are often confused by people with what are called the amicable numbers. Okay, so there's a thing called an amicable pair, all right? And an amicable pair is two integers that if you add up the proper divisors, then one number equals the other, okay? So for instance, if you take 220 and you look at its divisors, these are all the positive divisors of 220 except for 220 itself. And if you add those numbers together, it adds up to 284, okay? On the other hand, if you take 284 and look at its positive divisors and you add those together, it adds up to 220, okay? So this makes an amicable pair. Um, and let's see. Okay, um, I do not know whether there are infinitely many of those or not, okay, uh, amicable pairs. All right, let's move to happy numbers, okay? And again, the, 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 way, to dis, the way to describe it is, is kind of wordy, and so I'll just demonstrate. And so take, for instance, the number seven, all right? So suppose you start with the number seven, and then you square it, and you get 49, all right? Then you take the individual digits of 49, you square those and add them together, okay? And then you take 97, which is the result, you square those and add them together. And then you square those and add them together, and then you square those and add them together, and you wind up with one. Any number that this process results in one is referred to as a happy number, okay? Why? I don't know, okay? Um, but it turns out that there's your list of happy numbers, and look, there's our old friend 13. So 13 is, he's solitary, but he's happy anyway, okay? Um, but he's also lucky, okay? Um, and it's, it's fairly easy to see, by the way, that there must be infinitely many happy numbers. Because if seven is a happy number, then so must 70 be, right? Because adding the zero doesn't change. And so then 70 and 700 and 7,000, and et cetera, would be uh, those. Um, there are, of course, unhappy numbers. And what happens with those is they wound up getting trapped in, in something like this. So start off with four, for instance, and you do the process. You get 16, you do it again, you get 37, and then you get 58, and then you get 89, and then you get 145, and then you get 42, and then you get 20, and then you're right back to four, okay? And so even if you keep going, what you do is you just go through this loop again and again and again, and you'll never get to one. And it turns out that every number that you can do this with uh, will eventually go to one or four, okay? So, um, and, and as I said, there are uh, infinitely many of those as well, okay? Um, let's talk about perfect numbers. Perfect number is a number that is equal to the sum of its own proper divisors. For instance, six. If you take the, the po proper divisors of six, one, two, and three, and add them together, you get six, okay? And the thing is about the perfect numbers, I talked about how the friendly pairs get big in a, in a hurry. The perfect numbers get big actually fairly quickly because the perfection is, is rare, as we all know. Uh, 28 also turns out to be a perfect number, okay? So does 496. Now this explains why six and 28 were a friendly pair because since six is equal to the sum of its divisors, its divisor density is one. Same thing with 28, same thing with 496, same thing with 8,128. Okay, which you'll notice I had to shrink down to even fit on the screen. Of course, there are more, okay, but as I said, they get large uh, rather quickly. Okay. Um, it is an open question. Not only is it an open question as to whether there are infinitely many perfect numbers, you might also notice that all of these perfect numbers are even. It's also an open question as to whether there are any odd perfect numbers, although we have checked with computers up to 10 to the 1500th power, okay, without finding any odd perfect numbers, okay? Um, let's talk about fractions a little bit, because, ooh, fractions, that's, those are fun numbers, and, and students love to do crazy things with fractions. In fact, I... <laughs> And, and some of you know this, right? And I've even told my, my trig class. I, so one time on a, on a trig uh, exam, I gave a, a, a thing and said, simplify the following. And they had to use trig identities. And, and what they were supposed to do is boil it down to sine over cosine and then simplify that to the tangent function. Well, one student did all the stuff with the, with the identities correctly, came down to sine or cosine, and then said, well, you know what? Look, there's an S, there's an S, I can cancel those. There's an X, there's an X, I can cancel those. And wrote that the answer was N over co. All right. 
Well, fortunately, there would be cases where this student's technique would work. For instance, if you take the fraction 16 over 64 and you cancel the 6 on the top and the bottom, you get a fourth, and that's actually what it's equal to. Okay? And there are others. You take 19 over 95 and you cancel the 9s, it, it gets one-fifth, which is actually what it's equal to. Same thing with 26 over 65. You cancel those and you get two-fifths. Okay? And 49 over 98, you cancel the 9s and you get 4 over 8, which of course is a half, but it, it looks better this way. Okay. Um, these are the only four fractions that have numerator and denominator less than 100 for which this applies. The astute observer will notice that in every case we have either canceled a 6 or 9, and I'm not sure if that's significant or not. Okay. Um, here's another fun fact with fractions, and this is due to Galileo. So take the first two odd positive integers and make a fraction, and you get the fraction one-third. Well, suppose instead you decide, I want to take the first two odd numbers and the next two odd numbers, add them together. What do you get? You get four twelfths, which is a third. Suppose instead you want to take the first three odd numbers, divide, add them together and divide by the sum of the next three. It's a third. And it works no matter how many you do. If you do four of them and add the first four divided by the sum of the next four, it's a third. Add the first five divided by the next five, it's still a third, okay? And Galileo was able to demonstrate that this works for any n. You take the first n odd integers, add them up, and divide by the sum of the next n odd integers. That fraction always reduces to one third, which is a pretty neat fact. Now, you may be wondering, does it work with even integers as well? Because that's the next logical question. Well, let's just try it. So you take the first two even integers, put one over the other, you get that, and then at the next stage, nope. It doesn't work, okay? So it is something peculiar to the odd numbers. All right, okay, almost done here. All right, well, baseball season is, is newly underway, and so let's look at an example from baseball, okay? Everybody remembers this guy, at least you've heard of him. Probably don't remember him, I guess that's <laughs> perhaps a, 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 the wrong word to use. But uh, you may know that, that Babe Ruth for a long time was the home run king of, of baseball. He hit 714 home runs over his career. The last one was on May 25th, 1935. And he held that record for quite a long time, almost 40 years, until this man came along. Hank Aaron, Hammer and Hank as they, as they called him. Uh, he came along and on April 8th, 1974, so just last week, many years ago, he broke Babe Ruth's home run record. Okay. And of course, since Babe Ruth had 714 home runs, that must mean that on April 8, 1974, he hit his 715th home run. Um, he did. He eventually wound up with a total, anybody know the total? Any baseball aficionados? 755, exactly so. He eventually wound up hitting 755 home runs, and for many years, uh, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium and the subsequent Turner Field was list listed at the, the street address was 755 Hank Aaron Boulevard, okay? Um, Turner Field still is at 755 Hank Aaron Boulevard, but that's no longer where the Atlanta Braves uh, play their games, okay? Um, and so um, here's an interesting coincidence that a guy named Carl Pomerantz, a mathematician, noticed. If you take 714 and you look at its prime factorization, it factors like this, 2 times 3 times 7 times 17, 715 factors like this, and a funny thing happens if you add those prime factors together, you get the same number. Okay? They both add up to 29. And so this type of uh, arrangement, a pair of consecutive integers, that if you add the prime factors of each, they add up to the same number. This is now known in the literature as a Ruth Aaron pair of numbers. <laughs> really, it is, okay? Um, and there are lots of uh, Ruth Aaron pairs. In fact, that same, that same uh, guy, Carl Pomerantz, proved in 1978 that there are infinitely many uh, Ruth Aaron pairs. So there are infinitely many pairs of consecutive integers uh, that do this, okay? All right. Well, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to close. Uh, oh, wait, wait a minute. There was one other thing I wanted to say about 714 and 715, which is what happens if you multiply them? If you multiply them, well, then, of course, you saw that those, those two factorizations. So if you multiply them and rearrange them, what you see is that they are the, the product of the first seven prime numbers. 
Now, we saw the first seven prime numbers a little earlier with 666. Coincidence, huh? Interesting. Okay. Don't, don't read too much into that. By the way, if you add 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and 17, just straight up add them, you get 58, which appears to be a singularly uninteresting number. Uh, there's, there's really not, it, it's so uninteresting that it doesn't even have a, an entry in the Penguin Dictionary of Curious and Interesting Numbers, okay? Which maybe that makes it interesting all by itself, okay? Um, so let's see. Well, we're just about out of time here. Uh, I wanted to go close with, uh, well, a couple of personal anecdotes. I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip one of them. Um, some years ago, uh, a wonderful lady who used to work here named Elise Rudolph, many of you remember Elise, she taught mathematics here for a long time. She asked me one time, she said, Tony, what inspired you to become a mathematician? What inspired me? Gosh, I, I, I don't know. I never really thought of it in those terms before. So I thought about it for a little while, and, and, and I said, well, I said, here's something I can remember. Okay, I remember when I was younger, probably seventh or eighth grade, lying in bed one night trying to go to sleep, thinking about numbers because I was a nerd. And I, and I, I got to thinking about the, you know, the, the non-negative integers, zero, one, two, three, and all of this. And then I thought, started thinking about the squares of these numbers. Okay, so zero, one, four, nine, 16, 25. And then I started, as the Brits would say, minding the gap. Okay, and started thinking about the, the difference between these. So if you take one of these, for instance, you take one, you take this one and you subtract its immediate predecessor, you get one. And then you take four and you subtract one and you get three. And then you do the nine minus four, five. And 16 minus nine is seven. And 25 minus 16 is nine. And so it certainly looks like the gap between these square numbers are increasing as the odds. And so I, I lay there in bed thinking about this, and I thought, well, you know, no matter how many of these I, I try this with and figure it out, that's not really a proof, because maybe there's one way out there that for which it doesn't work. So then I got to thinking, well, wait a minute, there's a way to prove this. And the way to prove this is to think about this. If you'd let n be some integer, then n plus 1 is the next one, okay? And then, well, if you take n plus 1 and square it and you subtract n, what you get is... 2n plus 1. And as my Math 250 students over here know, this is the very definition of an odd integer. Okay? And I remember at that, at that point realizing that this was, this was remarkable, because not only had I realized that it was true up to you know, 40, 49 or whatever, but this proves it's true forever. And that's probably the first inkling. That's, that, so that was the closest I could come to an inspiration for why I, I got into mathematics, was the, the, the notion that I just, in, in lying there in my bed, had come up with something that proved that this was true for infinitely many numbers. Okay? Um, and, and here's one last thing. I'll, I'll close on this. Um, there is a way to do this visually. And if you go back to this, this square, Okay, and so what you see here is this is a, this is a seven by seven ar array of numbers. So let's look at what the, the difference is going from the six by six. Okay, so there's your six by six. And if I wanted to add on to that to get to the next square, what do you add? Well, up here, you have to add one copy of n. And then over here, you add another copy of n, and there's your plus one. So there's the two n plus one that gets you from six squared to seven squared. Okay. All right, well, I think we're out of time. I'll skip over the rest of the stuff I was going to do and get to the sources, as always, Wolfram MathWorld and, of course, Wikipedia. Uh, and then this, the Penguin Dictionary of Curious and Interesting Numbers, I, I, I recommend. It's not exactly the kind of thing you want to sit down and read like a novel, but it's a fun little reference, and it's got lots of neat stuff. And then, of course, uh, Elevatorpedia and the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences as well. Okay. <laughs>